This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. This podcast is brought to you with support from the Mark Sanders Foundation. We live in an increasingly uncertain and complex world with a casual attitude towards objective facts. Citizens often don't know what the truth is or where to find it. The Mark Sanders Foundation has the toolkit to address this global issue, philosophy. Through academic excellence and inclusive outreach programmes, the Mark Sanders Foundation helps deepen understanding through innovation in philosophy for a more informed world. Learn more at www.marksandersfoundation.org And that's Mark with a C, M-A-R-C, Sanders Foundation. It is natural for us to use ethical concepts in our everyday lives, to hold a person responsible for their actions, for example, to praise or blame them. But when did humans first start using ethical talk, and how did this arise? Philip Pettit has a story, a useful story, he says, even if it's not true. Philip Pettit, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much. The topic we're going to focus on is the birth of ethics. Now, before we get on to the birth, perhaps we could just clarify, what is ethics? Well, what I'm thinking of ethics is, the best thing to contrast it with is just altruistic behaviour. It's more than altruistic behaviour. I mean, animals of all kinds display altruistic behaviour. We now have many evolutionary explanations of that. But when you've got ethics, certainly people who move by ethics are going to behave in good part in many contexts in an altruistic way, but there's only ethics at the origin of that behavior when they've got concepts of an appropriate kind that are regulating the behavior that are accessible to them, like they think they ought to, they think that this is what's valuable, they think that this is what's right, and they think that they will be blameworthy, for example, for not acting in that way. It's when you've got those concepts that are driving and regulating the behavior and the relatively altruistic behaviour, it's only then that you've got ethics in the sense I think about it. So a chimpanzee might care for another member of its family in an altruistic way, possibly, but that wouldn't be an ethical concern because it can't conceptualise what it's doing? I would say in a case like that, the animal is behaving ethically, if you wish, but it's not thinking in an ethical manner, and ethics is present only when you've got both ethical thinking and consequently ethical behavior. So does that mean it requires language? That's what I believe myself because I think that it's hard to explain how we could ever have developed or how any creatures could ever develop the ethical language of the valuable, the responsible and so on unless they already had language in some form available to them. I think of it as a development that would have come on stream in the wake of language and in the story that I want to tell about how ethics might have been born, it's very important that there's language there in the first place. It's interesting you describe it as a story because I know that it's not meant to be true necessarily, your story of the birth of ethics. No, because counterfactual stories are often extremely illuminating and what I want to tell is a counterfactual story about the birth of ethics. So perhaps you could explain what a counterfactual story is, first of all, Probably the best way to do that is to remind you of something that actually an awful lot of people are aware of, which is from Economics 101, so to speak. You ask, what is money? And economists for now, well over 100 years, say, if you want to know what money is, imagine, and now they tell a counterfactual story, imagine a society where people operated with barter alone. Imagine the difficulties they would have had I, for example, am involved in making furniture. You're involved in producing potatoes. I want potatoes, but you don't want furniture, so I can't give you a bit of furniture. I can't even give you an IOU in furniture because you don't think you'll ever want furniture. I've got to go and find somebody who's willing to give me potatoes for the furniture I can provide them with. The standard economic story then explains how in almost any circumstance as some commodity would emerge as a commodity that a lot of people want and then it becomes common knowledge that a lot of people want it. For example, think of cigarettes in post-World War II Berlin or think, if you like, of gold as it may have been at some stage in human history. And once people believe that an awful lot of people want this commodity, 
they're going to want to have that commodity because if they have it, they can trade with it. And, of course, you can also, if there are then reliable goldsmiths, for example, or sources of cigarettes, you can get IOUs issued. You can get something happening like gold, a privileged commodity being passed around a lot, serving this purpose, or IOUs and gold. And then, as economists say, now look, would we call that gold and those gold IOUs money? And you think, well, I guess we would. And then the suggestion is, well, wait a moment, that's just what we mean by money. It's a commodity that actually serves the same role in our society as the imaginary gold serves in that society. Isn't it a good candidate for what money means? So now I've got an understanding of money. And that was all generated on the basis of an as-if history, a counterfactual story. And it's very striking that many historians of money now argue there never was a pure barter society but that story is still illuminating about the nature of money. If you had the choice of telling the actual story of how ethics emerged, or a counterfactual one, which would be the better story to tell? Well, of course, it would be wonderful if we did have a totally convincing actual story about the origin of ethics. I mean, there are very good accounts in the evolutionary literature, very imaginative. They're all speculative, of course. The one I probably know best and I think very well of is the account that Michael Tomasello, for example, the evolutionary psychologist, offers in a recent book. But those are very speculative. But the sort of illumination that I look for from a counterfactual story is not provided necessarily by that sort of actual history. He might actually come across some signs that we interpret as they were expressing a notion of ought or of valuable, you know, back then in maybe 20,000 years ago or whatever, It wouldn't tell you anything, really, about the nature of ethics, whereas a counterfactual story that's suitably designed may well give you that sort of sense of the nature and the role of ethics. Okay, so what is your story of the emergence of ethics? What is the story that best illuminates what ethics is? Well, let's see, in order to sort of give a sense of what I think needs to be done, let's distinguish between value concepts, concepts to do with what you ought to do, what it's right to do, what you're obliged to do, what would be wrong not to do, and so on. On the one hand, value concepts, and on the other are concepts you might call responsibility concepts, as in he or she was responsible for doing this, they're blameworthy for doing it, they're commendable for not doing it or whatever, they're suitable objects of resentment or indignation. Call those the responsibility concepts. So what I want is a an as-if story, a counterfactual genealogy, that will give us a sense of how people might have evolved both value concepts and responsibility concepts, and at the same time the corresponding practices, so that that will then give us a candidate for how we get to think about, talk about, the valuable and the responsible. So what are the crucial elements of this story? Oh dear, well, let's see. (laughs) So in the story I tell, ground zero, as you might say, where the story begins, like the barter society in the money case, is a society, I imagine, in which people exactly like us otherwise have got language, but they use this language wholly to give information to one another. I tell you where the fish are running and you tell me where you found the ripening fruit or whatever it might be. As the story develops, I argue that people are going to have an interest in establishing their credibility. That's really going to be very important, you know, in communicating with somebody else. There's one thing they can do to establish their credibility. They can make it expensive, so to speak, to communicate their attitudes. So, for example, you want to know, does Jones, is he trustworthy? Does he really want a peaceful relationship with us. And I say, yes, he does desire that. And it turns out that he doesn't behave as you'd expect if he had that desire, and you come to me to complain. Well, I can get off the hook, so to speak, claim that I'm still a truth teller, still expect your reliance on me by saying, well, either there are two things, obviously. One is that, well, you know, I must have misheard or misunderstood his intentions. You know, the evidence must have been misleading. Or the other thing I may say is that, you know, he changed. He changed his mind about things like that since I spoke to you. So there's the misleading mind and the changed mind excuse that I can use to get off the hook. So my words are fairly cheap when I told you about Jones. One thing we're going to be interested in in my 
ground zero society. I want to make myself credible in this society. It would be nice if I could, for example, convey or communicate the desires I have, say, for a peaceful relationship with you, in such a way that I couldn't get off the hook so easily because then my words would be more expensive, right? Well, there is one way I can do it. So, for example, instead of saying, yeah, I think I desire, you know, that there's peace and so on, thinking about myself like I'm another person, I might say something like, peace is great, expressing, so to speak, the desire. If I do that to convey the desire, and I don't later display that desire and you complain to me, I can't say, gee, I must have gotten that desire wrong because I made up the desire, you know, in expressing it. I didn't just scan my mind to find I had that desire. I made up my mind to desire that when I said to you, peace is great, let's have peace. That means it's a more expensive way of communicating my desire because I can't get off the hook so easily as I could in reporting on another person. I didn't quite understand why that's more expensive. Is it because there are consequences for me if I get it wrong? Yes. After all, the background assumption, and I tried to defend that, is that we each care about a reputation with the other, you know, as being someone reliable, because otherwise you don't get people to rely on us and we can't communicate, we can't cooperate with them. And what I'm doing in conveying the desire in that way where I can't get off the hoop by saying I was misled about my mind, I stake my reputation on actually proving to be a peace lover. If I don't prove to be that, then I may claim, well, you know, I changed my mind since then. I used to be a peace lover. I can use that excuse, maybe. But I certainly can't use the excuse, oh, I must have gotten myself wrong. So in that way, it's more costly than if I'm wrong about a third person. I understand that. Now, have we got to ethics at that point, or is that just a sense in which I've got some flesh in the game now? I mean, there are many stages, as there is in the money story, and I simplify the money story, so let's simplify this. The thought I have is the following, that once we're each making ourselves more credible to the other by avowing, let's call it, our desires, and where I, by vowing, I mean we can't get off the hook by saying we got ourselves wrong. No misleading mind excuse. When we get to avowing desires like that, we immediately confront the following possibility that we have devoured a whole range of desires, like for peace with other people, for truth-telling, for promise-keeping, and so on. And hey, we're in a situation where I really want to hit this guy, you know? Or I you know, really don't want to tell the truth about this, it's so embarrassing, or I really don't want to keep that promise. We're going to find ourselves suddenly sort of schizoid between on the one hand, we judge something to be, it's what I avowed a desire for, right? And what my reputation is invested in, it's who I said I am. You can rely on me to be like that. And on the other hand, we have the self who is actually attracted to not be peaceful, to punch someone in the eye, to tell a lie and so on. And so you open up that sort of division within the self between what's desired and what's valued. And I think that's the first moment of where the idea of ethics appeared. What also appears at that point is that to go with what's desired actually but not valued when those divergences do occur is a sort of failure because after all now you didn't live up to the self that you projected so to speak and invited other people to rely on. So there's a sort of failure involved in going with what's just contingently desired rather than what you avowed as to be desired and what you might call as valuable. Let's introduce that now. So the idea is that these creatures will be in a position to use a word like valuable for the things they had avowed desires for, where they stake their reputation in, and now you've got the notion of the valuable appearing. That might give you a sense at least of how I think the genealogy might go at that point on, with respect to the valuable concepts. It strikes me in the way you've told that story that this is very much a social issue. It's not an individual coming to a conclusion in isolation, but it's all about how you're perceived, whether you follow through on the values that you avow. Absolutely. We all have been attracted in the past by the idea of developing, as, as it were, a Cartesian theory of ethics, you know? Just finding in ourselves, like resources, like the requirement of being a rational agent, whereby you can graft morality onto that. So if you're going to be properly rational, you've got to be moral. 
I think actually that morality comes in in the wake of social life, not just in the wake of personal individual morality. And that becomes actually even more salient to me when you move from the valuable concepts to the responsible concepts, the responsibility concepts. So perhaps you could say just a little bit about the responsibility concepts then. I mean, how do we get a notion of responsibility? Well, and this really is simplifying the story a lot, where I associate value concepts with avowed desire. So the avowedly desired becomes the valuable in contrast with the actually desired. I associate uh, responsibility concepts with what I call pledges rather than desires. Now, with the avowal, I said that you close down one excuse, the misleading mind excuse for getting off the hook when you prove not to live up to the attitude you communicated. But there's a further sort of speech act, call it pledging, where not only do I close down the excuse, must have got my mind wrong, but I also close down the excuse, I changed my mind. So if I pledge, for example, to meet you tonight at the football match or at the theater or whatever, and I don't turn up, I can't excuse myself by saying, well, I must have got myself wrong when I said I'll be at the match, right? But neither, if it's clear that I pledged by conventions, neither is it going to be as I say, well, I changed my mind. You're going to say, you changed your mind, you pledged, you know, or promised. How could you? So you shut down both excuses. So that's a really expensive speech act, so to speak. Your reputation is very highly invested in that, staked in that. Okay, so I think that if we're creatures now who make pledges to another of that kind... Then we're creatures who know or assume, insofar as we accept those pledges, that we each care about how we stand with the other. We care about their reputation. But that means any one of us can now exhort the other to behave in a certain way. So, for example, you've made a promise to a third person, and you've confessed to me that you're inclined to break it. And I can say to you, look, you made a promise. You're going to maybe suffer reputationally now. And I say to you, look... You've got to do this, Nigel. You can keep that promise, you know. Now, suppose you fail to keep the promise and you come to me shamefacedly and admit afterwards, gee, I, I just couldn't do it, you know, so I, I just didn't turn up. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I'm, I feel bad. And I said to you, look, Nigel, you did wrong in doing that. We all agree with that. You broke the rules of promising. Let's call it down. And I say, you could have kept that promise. Now, this is the notion of responsibility. If I think you could have kept that promise, I'm not treating you like a deterministic mechanism. I'm thinking you have that ability that I'm expressing. And what I want to say is that for these people, that would be a natural way of conveying the same attitude towards you as they might have conveyed before the act by saying, you can do it. Afterwards, you fail to do it. I say, you could have done it, you know, expressing the same hortatory sort of attitude. And that fits exactly with my sort of image, that ethics emerges on a social basis among creatures who, in order to achieve credibility with one another, have the idea of avowing their desires, giving them entry, so to speak, to the space of the valuable, the idea of the valuable versus the attractive. But equally, these creatures who come to recognize that they have an influence on one another are going to be exhorting one another and in exhorting one another, they're going to open up the entry to the space of responsibility because there's going to be now the possibility of, as it were, retrospective exhortation, which I think is what blame really is. In telling the story of the birth of ethics, did you change your mind about aspects of ethics? Or do you think you were telling a story that illustrated something you believed already? Yeah, I mean, this may be disingenuous, I suppose, but the truth is I really didn't know where it was going to lead me. I mean, I'd always been very taken by the notion of contractual genealogy, and I do feel that while it's often been used in philosophy, it's not often recognized as being used. So, for example, H.L.A. Hart, you know, and explain what law is, did exactly that. You go to a society without law, you describe predicaments and problems that people would have faced, and hey, presto, you tell a story about how something would emerge that now deserves to be called law. So I really wanted to do that for ethics because of partly being very frustrated. I'm a naturalist about ethics and I'm a realist about ethics, you know. 
and being very frustrated at the stalemate, really, between the different sides on that issue and the somewhat snide attitude sometimes adopted by people on either side of that divide. And I thought, well, maybe this might be a way through. Philip Pettit, thank you very much. A real pleasure. Thank you. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us. We now have a few more podcasts. Nigel has one on philosophy and places they're associated with, www.philosophysites.com. And there's also Thinking Books, www.thinkingbooks.co. I have a podcast devoted specifically to moral and political philosophy, www.philosophy247.org. And there's one on the social sciences. Just Google Social Science Bites. <laughs> <laughs>